The Prime Minister has set the bar high. 850,000 jobs back by July. A large slice of our returning workforce should come from the hospitality sector. But with a 10-person limit, the numbers don't add up for many cafes and restaurants to reopen. The Cipri family, brothers Joe, Carmelo and Anthony, right, bring a slice of Italy to the heart of Paddington. They've adapted their casual dining, Barbetta, to takeaways, coffees, house-made pastas, soups and sauces. And while they do it all with a smile, it's been tough. Business is down by almost half. Probably the hardest thing's been the staff, because we uh, we've had to let go of a, a lot of staff. They're all... Hopefully they're on hold, they're going to all come back. In a cautious approach, the Morrison government has moved to allow cafes and restaurants to open to 10 people. When that will happen here in New South Wales, the Berejiklian government hasn't revealed, so we don't know. And for this family business, reopening to just 10 at a time doesn't make financial sense. Still going to have to employ a waiter or two, they're going to have a, a full-time chef there. We may sit out the first, uh, the first round and wait till the um, 20 people. Next door, their 100-seat restaurant, Cipri, has been closed since March. It, along with pubs, clubs and large venues, will have to remain so for a while yet, leaving thousands of workers across the country in limbo. There will be venues that will not come out of this, uh, this crisis. They, they won't be able to reopen because of the financial pressure that they're under or that when they do reopen, they're severely restricted on the patron numbers they have inside. The 10-person rule still comes with those density restrictions we saw at the start of the pandemic. Even with such small numbers, customers still need to be spaced out. One person every four square metres on average. In Liverpool, Cucina 105 is ready to open to sittings of 10, weighing up the cost of chefs and waitstaff with a drastically reduced bottom line. We've gone from 150 people on a Saturday night to selling pizza and pasta at a cheaper price just to survive. Ten people is better than no people in our restaurants. Lizzie Pearl, Nine News. After having two of my own family members diagnosed with the coronavirus, I wanted to share why so many black people are dying of COVID-19. But as a nurse of over 35 years, I am greatly concerned. I work in the healthcare field right here in the Washington DC area. And I'm seeing a trend that I want to bring to the attention of my fellow Black Americans, Black Caribbean folks, Blacks of any kind or shape, wherever you come from, that I think you all need to be aware of. That is, for folks who are showing symptoms of COVID-19, our symptoms as Blacks are different. You don't have a cough, you don't have a temperature, yet our folks are dying at a higher rate than any other nationality or group. And that is because instead of a fever and a cough, what our folks are showing up with is what we in healthcare call malaise or you just don't feel right. And on top of that, what happens is you start having either pain in an extremity or you just start feeling a little winded. Guess what? If this is happening to you, you need not to go lay down. The clock is ticking. This coronavirus brings on bleeding inside our bodies, whether it's in our extremities, in our hearts, or in our lungs, causing blood clots, and that's what's killing our black feet, folks. Now, if you can't get to a doctor, then you need to get up and walk. You need to start taking deep breaths as much as possible. 
Use some of your old home remedies. You know how your granny used to give you the garlic and the lemon and the um, ginger? Make yourself a poultice of onions. Put it on your chest. But it's by time that we start doing something for ourselves. We are losing our black males especially faster than the doctors and the lawyers can pick them up. And the reason for that is one of the symptoms that is very common among our black men is pain in the muscles. And guys, no pun intended. Most men, when they start to have a pain of any kind, wants to lay down. This is not the time to lay down. If you lay down, your lungs is filling with blood. And when that blood starts clotting, you can no longer pass oxygen to your bloodstream. So I'm no major doctor, but I've seen too many die in the last couple of weeks like this. And if you really start thinking, you go back as far as February, where we started finding people in their beds dead. And it really seems like it's that virus that was already in our community. So black folks, don't get stupid because they tell you you got your stimulus check and you're going out to go get your hair done or your nails done. Please protect yourselves, not just for you, but for your family. Let us be wise about what we're doing. We know we're always the group they're ready to do uh, experiment on or the group that they feel is dispensable. It's time we start taking care of ourselves. Please pass this information on to your friends and families. We need to do better. We need to take care of ourselves. We need to make sure that we're getting enough rest eating properly, cover your nose and mouth. But more importantly, if you don't have to go out, stay home. I have too many nurses who work under me who are now out because they've been infected. Healthcare workers do not want to do this. And it's not fair to ask them to give their lives when you're not doing your part. Let's stop the craziness. Let's show them that we are no better or no worse than anybody else. Please pass the message on. Let's stop the coronavirus dead in its tracks. Let's cover each other with prayer, but let us be intelligent about what we need to do. It is 8.42 New York time, and I got to my regular unit, and they took my patient away, my black guy. And now I'm getting switched units. This is exactly what happened before at the other hospital. As soon as I told somebody, and like, like management, and tried to advocate for my patient, they take the patient away from me, and then they move me. So, like, I legitimately don't even know what to do anymore. Like, even the advocacy groups don't give a shit about these people. Like, literally, like, black lives don't matter here. And, I mean, that's pretty sad that somebody who is white and lives hundreds of miles away from the city gives more of a shit about these people than the actual people in this city. Like, for real. Like, I had a complete breakdown yesterday because... You know, I missed an important email to do a revision on my proposal, so my proposal got canceled because I was trying to advocate for my patient and talk to management here and get the care that he needs because he's being medically mismanaged. Um, and I just had a complete fucking breakdown because, you know what, my entire proposal got canceled because I 
you know, wasted my time advocating for a fucking patient who's just going to die anyway. <sighs> you know, and sure enough, they take the patient away from me. And then almost two hours into the shift, they switch me units. This is exactly what happened at the other hospital when I was advocating for the little Hispanic lady. You know, guys, here's the thing. Let me try and put things into context for you, okay? I know not everybody's going to live. I'm not that fucking green or ignorant or, you know, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed to think that, okay? I know we're going to have a shit ton of people die. But these people aren't dying from COVID. Let me give you several examples here. Uh, an anesthesiologist um, intubated the patients, like I think it was right, uh, bran like bronchi and of a patient, and they couldn't get the sats up. And for about five hours, like we were waiting on a chest X-ray to confirm that the placement was wrong. And in the meantime, while we're waiting for that, and we've told the anesthesiologist that it was placed wrong because, like, literally only one side of his fucking chest is like inflating. Um, he dies. Okay. Um, a patient had a heart rate of forty, and the resident. <laughs> started doing chest compressions on him, which is not what you do. You just externally pace them or you, you know, give him some atropine. And then, you know, I run in there to stop him from doing chest compressions on somebody with a fucking pulse. And then he decides to push Epi. He throws some pads on them, on him to, to defibrillate the guy in bradycardia. Okay, he has a heart rate of 40 in a stable, you know, bradycardic rhythm, we just need to give him, some, like, some atropine and pace him, he fucking defibrillates him and kills him. And I was literally ran out of, like, the patient's room to get, like, the director of nursing who was standing out there. And I'm like, can you stop him? He's going to kill that patient. He's going to kill that patient if he defibrillates him with bradycardia and a heart rate of 40. And the director of nursing just shook his head. And I turned around, and he killed the dude. Okay, there was a nurse who played, placed an NG tube into, um, into some guy's lungs and filled his lungs with tube feeding. There was a nurse who confused uh, a long-acting insulin with a short-acting acting insulin and gave 30 units of a fast-acting insulin and killed the guy. <sighs> what else? Other stuff have I seen? Yeah, it's just here they're just going to let them rot on the vent. They're medically mismanaging these patients. And, like, I'm not a doctor, guys. I'm not professing to be a doctor by any means. But there's, like I said, basic standards of care that we have to do. Like, when somebody's low on blood, like, literally on the brink of a critical low blood level, we should replace the blood. But I asked the residents, and they're like, does he have internal bleeding? And I said, no. Then they're like, well, we're not replacing the blood. Well, here's the thing. In these COVID patients, they all eventually need a blood transfusion. Their blood, like, if you don't have enough blood to actually oxygenate your body, the vent settings don't fucking matter, okay? <laughs> they don't matter because you have no oxygen carrying capacity of your blood, okay? <sighs> I told you about the patient where, like, all that, like, purulent drainage just kept seeping into his lungs because the ET tube cuff w was leaking and nobody has a fucking manometer here to check the pressures. And I finally figured that out. And I kept saying, hey, you know what? His white blood cell count is steadily, like, you know, we're having a problem with it. Like, do you want to start some antibiotics? No. Well, does he have a fever? And I said, no, he doesn't have a fever. They didn't want to start antibiotics. Day shift nurse finally got a chest x-ray. He has full-blown pneumonia now. Like, I've been telling them this for a while, but because he didn't have a fever, they didn't want to give him antibiotics. <sighs> we have a nurse who, like, fell asleep at the fucking nurse's station while we were all in rooms, and her norepinephrine ran out, and the guy had no fucking blood pressure and didn't perfuse his brain, and now I'm pretty sure he's brain dead. That same nurse is now running a CRRT machine, a dialysis-like machine, that she has never done before. She said she'll figure it out. Okay? 
I'm pretty fucking smart, and I figure a lot of shit out, but I would never attempt to try and figure out a CRRT machine on the fly. Like, we are adequately staffed. There's a shit ton of staff in there, like, and we have a nurse who does CRRT in there. She has a different patient load. We told them, like, hey, let's just swap these nurses so the one that knows how to work this machine can work this machine, but they didn't want to do that. So I'm pretty sure that patient will be dead here in a couple hours. And this is why I freaked the fuck out yesterday. Because nobody is listening. They don't care what is happening to these people. They don't. I'm literally coming here every day and watching them kill them. I mean, we're not going to save everybody. That's fine. Like, come on, guys. We're not God. But, like, some of these people, hey, we know that they're not going to live. Let's start a hospice unit or something, you know? Like, they don't need to be in the ICU. Let's change course. Let's do palliative care or something. Like, literally, some of these people are just on sedation to keep them on the vents. Nothing else. I have a lady on a trank on a vent, and she's not even fucking cognizant. She's not even on sedation. You know what we give her every day? We give her breathing treatments, albuterol, and uh, she gets uh, insulin. And that's it. And that's it. We're not treating the COVID, guys. Like, for real, we're not treating the COVID. <sighs> you know, every day we try and get these guys off the vents, right? Because, you know, there's criteria for weaning. Every day, the day shift nurse will wean them down, like, to, like, minimum sedation. <sighs> every night, we come in and we get the same two residents and they fucking max out all the sedation again and undo all the work from the day shift. Then the day shift attending will come in and they'll all do rounds and they'll be like, he wasn't synchronizing with the vent. So we had to turn all the sedation on. And I'm like, he wasn't synchronizing with the vent because it's in the wrong vent mode. So, I legit don't even know what to do anymore. Like, I tried calling advocacy groups. I tried talking with management here, like the nursing admin. Like, nothing. Nobody's doing anything. We still have a 100% mortality rate in the ICU unit. I just left. But, I mean, they're living longer because we have, like, legit ICU nurses there. So, CDC finally, like, not the CDC, FDA approved yesterday the remdesivir study. Like, to start using remdesivir for uh, COVID patients. Guys, I don't even know what to do anymore. And this is why I had a complete fucking breakdown. Like, I literally had to call my friend Lisa and FaceTime her. And she answered the fucking phone while she was in the shower. Because she, like, knew I was having a hard time to talk to her. Because it's like going in the fucking twilight zone. Like, everyone here is okay with this. Look, the only way I can kind of put this into context for everybody is... And this is going to be kind of an extreme example. This is like really the only thing I can come up with. It's like if we were in Nazi Germany and they were like taking the Jews to go put them in a gas chamber, I'm the one like there saying, hey, this is not good. This is bad. This is wrong. We should not be doing this. And then everyone tells me, hang in there. You're doing a great job. You can't save everybody. You're, you know, you're amazing. You're a great nurse. Guys. I know I'm a fucking good nurse. I know I go in there and I give it 500% every day. I know I'm not being negligent. Okay? I fucking know that. What I need is someone to help me save these people from being killed. Okay? From gross negligence and complete medical mismanagement. And no one is listening to me. Like, for real, nobody's listening. I even tried getting a hold, like, of black advocacy groups here. <laughs> they just put me on hold or hang up on me. Tried talking to management. Now I got moved units. Like, 
I legit don't know what to do anymore. Can someone come up with like some type of a solution for me? Because I'm kind of out of ideas. You know, when I and try and talk with some of the other nurses here and they're like, well, you can't save everybody. And they all know what's happening. They all agree with me and they all just shake their heads. And I'm like, am I the only one who is not a sociopath? To think that this is okay? I mean, guys, they literally don't even know when they're dead. Like, how many times have I told you they've assigned me a dead person? <laughs> like, how long have they been dead? Nobody knows. <laughs> like, how is anybody assessing anything without a stethoscope? Normally we have, like, those disposable stethoscopes. But I knew what we were coming into, so I brought my old chunky one. Nobody, nobody has listened to anybody's lungs as long as I've been here. Even with disposable stethoscopes. I, you know, I keep telling them that, you know, the guys are like, the, my patient's going acidotic. We need to do something about this before his kidneys shut down, you know, give him some bicarb or something like that. And this is what they do. They let the patient's blood get acidotic, their kidneys shut down, and then at the last minute, another fucking trauma. This is like the fifth fucking trauma tonight. Some dude got fucking shot in front of the hospital. Like, two to the chest and two to the abdomen. What the fuck is wrong with these people? <sighs> yeah, so anyways, kidneys shut down, and at the last fucking minute, they finally decide to run bicarb. So they run five liters of bicarb into a person who's gained 20 pounds of water weight and completely throw him into heart failure, and he dies several hours later. That was one of my patients. So I let them home. Like they had me start the bicarb like before I left one night. And by the time I had come back in the next shift, he was dead. And they assigned him to me. And he was already in a body bag. <laughs> like guys, they're not dying of COVID, okay? Like, yeah, people are going to fucking die of COVID. Like, yeah, some people legit will end up with multi-organ failures and will legit throw the clots and kill them, like, and die, people. I fucking know this. I'm not, like, some fucking new grad, okay? That's going to save everybody in the world, okay? I am literally telling you that they're murdering these people. And nobody will listen to me. I mean, like I said, I'm not a doctor, but... I'm pretty sure that when you defibrillate somebody with a heartbeat of 40 in a stable rhythm and you kill them, that's murder. And I'm pretty sure that when you put somebody's peep up to like 25 and peep doesn't go past, I think like 15, 20, and you, you blow their lungs out and they die, I'm pretty sure that's murder. <sighs> You know, I mean, I've just watched a doctor drop a central line and fucking rupture, like, the sub, like, clavian, like, vein, and the guy fucking bled to death. I mean, COVID didn't break that central line. COVID didn't kill that guy. I mean, he was a COVID patient. I mean, every single patient I've taken care of, guys, is a COVID patient. Like, I've never had a non-COVID patient, Okay. I mean, I don't even know what to say anymore. So, and that's why I got upset yesterday. Because nobody's listening. I literally had to call my friend Lisa because I'm like, dude, I am not crazy, right? Like, this is wrong, right? Watched an anesthesiologist place an ET tube and rush for their esophagus, and the guy choked to death on his own blood. Ah, 
COVID didn't place that ET tube incorrectly. And nobody cares because they're all minorities and we're in the fucking hood. You know, and that's just not okay. You know, I grew up really poor. And so I know what it's like to be, like, completely forgotten and for nobody to advocate for you. And that's why I get really upset, guys. Because, like I said, I know that a lot of people are gonna die, but... You know... COVID didn't cause that pneumo. And incorrectly placed ET tube placed that pneumo. And then they wouldn't let me fix it. Like, all I had to do was, like, adjust it. And they wouldn't let me do it. <sighs> so if anyone's got any idea what the hell I can do to save my one black guy before they completely transfer me out of this hospital, that would be great. Because he's mentally there. When he sees us come in, his heart rate and his blood pressure drop up. And he doesn't sink with the vent. Because he can see us. And when we leave, he calms down again. He just physically can't communicate with us. Like I told you, I had Stephanie explain to him what was happening to him. Because you can't hear me very well through a respirator. Plus, I'm sure that respirator is probably scary. Especially if you're kind of out of your mind from all the sedation. But he's a cab driver and lives a couple blocks away from here. So. He has some family, but. The problem is. It said 999999 for the phone number and I didn't get the address before like I abruptly got moved I'm sitting in the vending machine room because it's nice and cool I'm in between units right now so they haven't realized I'm gone I figured I'd have a mini meltdown and then get my shit together because I've never been to the other unit <laughs> mind you I've been on this unit the whole time and whatever I'm flexible but once again you know I talked to admin the next day I got moved what happened at the other hospital. They don't care what's happening to these people. And I just have to keep watching them die. And <sighs> There's like this weird telenovela on. I think it's about a dog. Yeah, I mean, I tried talking to hospital management, I tried calling CMS, I tried calling the equivalency of their division of aging, I tried calling a couple black power groups in the area. <laughs> Who else? I mean, this took several hours, this is why I missed that email, the revision for my proposal, because, like, fuck, guys, I tried contacting a newspaper. Nobody called me back. So, <laughs> yeah, Stacy, fuck. You'd probably lose your mind because you're not a sociopath thinking this is all okay. That's just weird, guys. They're all okay with it. Like, I tell you, we get on the fucking bus and we go into the twilight zone here. Like, how do you not know when your patient is dead? For real. I mean, back at that other unit when shit was just crazy and bodies were just fucking dropping. Yeah, I can understand that. But guys, you have a shit ton of staff. Like, 
yeah, we have hundreds of extra nurses that have been are still here that are not part of hospital staff managing these patients, but we're on top of it now. We're on top of it now. There's no reason to not know when your patient's dead. I mean, there's no reason you should be managing a dialysis machine never knowing how to use a dialysis machine when there's a dialysis nurse in there. My hand's shaking because I'm so pissed. Yeah, that nurse that was sleeping in the corner there. She was she's from the she was from the ER yesterday, like when I had my first original breakdown. And uh and uh she's like, Well, they don't just unnecessarily intubate them, they try and you know, would you bite them? I'm like Girl, I am not fucking green. I know some, like, people need a, a tube dropped, okay? Like, I'm not saying that. Like, at the other hospital, they were doing unnecessary intubations because they had no fucking clue how to put the vent into, in, into CPAP or BiPAP. Yeah, I mean. So, I mean, but yeah, there's, like, legit indications. Like, fuck, that dude needs a tube. Yeah, I, I know that. I know that. <sighs> Yeah, my lead at the other hospital who advocated for the patients too. Like the first day I got there and I was in orientation, the, that crash course orientation, he warned me that I was going to have a problem. He would advocate for the patients too. They fucking moved him too. He's at a completely different hospital. I tried reaching out to him, but he hasn't texted me. Like, I, what do you think? I saw what was bad. He saw way worse shit than that. Look how bad my face look. I'm just putting my respirator on. They ain't gonna fucking know no different. I was in here freaking the fuck out. Alright, guys. I'm going to the new unit. Let's see how they kill them there, okay? Stay safe. Stay out of NYC for your healthcare.